Hello again, audience. It's been a little bit since the last time that we've talked, and I suppose I've got uh, a few things to explain. Last thing I did was a bit of a Skyrim stream, and I said that I wanted to get back into that stuff, but it was a bit of a strange time period for me. I won't go to the too into various details, but I effectively was in a position where I felt like I needed to move. That way I could work better and without as many distractions as usual. And today I want to get into a bit of a habit of streaming. But I've also realized that doing the gameplay thing is most certainly fun. But uh, it's, it's a bit repetitive. There's many people doing gameplay for Skyrim and lore videos for it, and I absolutely love the game. It's easily modded, and the lore is super in-depth. But that got me into thinking about things a little bit. I love lore. I love writing. And over the past few years, I have been working on something with a couple of friends. And I feel like I want to introduce that to the world. This stream, and hopefully a couple of streams to come, uh, will introduce people to, to what I've made, to what my friends have helped me build up. That's going to be the purpose of this podcast and other podcasts put on to the channel, just discussing the lore and introducing to the introducing the world um, what we fastened together. Today we'll be discussing the creation mythos of this little world. I am sure we'll come with with a more appropriate name for it later on, but we'll call it the Tales of Eartha for now. We'll start with a descriptor of this particular setting, how it all began, where it started. So, oh, hold on, I, I just recognized something. Uh, I may have, oopsie daisy, I, I, I gotta edit the stream real quick. That Skyrim anniversary thing that I've been talking about before, um, a little, little inaccurate, I gotta, I, ha I have to change that, I was... <laughs> It's not often that I stream, so I'm still quite a bit rusty. Uh, give me just one moment to better title. There we go. Updated. Now it's appropriate. Tales of Eartha. A podcast dedicated to covering lore for a little thing that I and my friends have made. Great. Fantastic. I'm good to go now. As for... What we're going to be doing it is going to be covering the creation mythos of the world and that starts a very very long time ago before anything in fact there was but darkness a great babbling brook of horrific monsters hidden within the vastness of space this was known as the eldritch void it was an endless pantheon of beasts go both great and small, all of them inconceivable to you and I. You could not quite understand what they thought, and perhaps that was for the best. They were all given their own motivations, but importantly, they were all asleep. Quiet, slumbering, there was no light nor stimulation, it was just them from the beginning. There was no beginning to they would be there then, and they would be there later at the end of time. They had no causation, and they were stagnant. Beyond them is a realm of dreams in which all minds dwell when they sleep. Ideas form there and manifest into more physical attributes. Shapes. If you thought of something, then it would reside there, and continue until your thought passes into something else. And then beyond that is the static, a fizzy, huzz hissing, <laughs> nowhere. It is static, gray, black, and white, nothing at all except for the bubble of reality, alone and somber. But one instance would change everything. It would sway the fates of these great shadows, these monsters in the dark, and that 
was the Epoch of Enlightenment. Amongst them was born the youngest Elder God. It took the form of a fetus the size of a star hidden inside of a gel-like film that glinted and glowed with the radiance of creation. This was known as the Illuminator, and it, in its awakening, caused a massive pain. The light that it radiated singed and burnt the darkness and created a barrier known as the Asylum. The pain of being struck by this light awoke the Eldritch Void. All the creatures that squirmed and wormed around inside of it were given stimulation. They were brought to life. As alive as these things could be, they could think with the induction of pain. And knowing what pain was now gave them pursuit. Pursuit of satisfaction. It woke them from their dreams. Gave them a bit of a perspective. But with the asylum formed that held the eldritch monstrosities at bay, the Illuminator was painfully alone. He was paradoxically omnipotent and thus could do anything he wished, but he had the mind of a newborn, a child, that only wanted company. That was his one motivation, the desire to play and to not be alone. And in this, he created countless worlds that harbored countless lives. And each era, if you will, tended to end with the consumption of their world. They would spend their resources or do something quite stupid, and it resulted in their destruction. It left him alone, and eventually he would come to create another the cycle would repeat time and time again. This happened endlessly until he finishes his gestation. But there are three worlds that are important to us for this tale. And the first of them is Abyssium. It was ruled by barbaric creatures that dominated their land and sucked resources from it endlessly. Their objective was to devour their world for strength and continue to eat and to eat to satisfy a never-ending hunger for power. But with no worlds hovering beyond themselves, only the Illuminator, they needed to find another way to satisfy their needs without completely and utterly destroying themselves as the many worlds that had come before them did. They had a leader amongst them named Satifir, and they were a beautiful and brilliant thing. They fulfilled the desires of their people and had come up with a magnificent idea to fulfill this great purpose of consumption, and that was a massive hammer and a massive nail, both given unbelievable capabilities, and Satifir intended to pop the bubble of reality, drill a hole that would allow them to leak into other worlds. What magnificence his people thought as they drove that wedge into the sky, only for Abyssium's lands to be pulverized in the wake of the devastating force that striking the boundaries of existence caused. Not a stone of their planet existed after the incident but it did indeed leave behind something. The embers of it burnt as the hole they punctured grew deeper and deeper, devouring the survivors and imprisoning them in a hell of their own creation. Ever growing, but only just cramped enough for discomfort, this hole in reality would swell and swell, if not for the Illuminator's intervention. Forming a mighty hand of stone, he clasped a crystalline palm around the rift and sealed it within the belly of a new world, dubbed Terra Firma, to which he would begin his next project. Extracting the hunger for resources and making the life forms on this world amorphous to prevent their harm, 
It hoped that they would exist for a longer period of time. And they did. A great population of peoples made a, of various fluids, taking the forms they desired and cooperating among one another, was given life. But as liquefied in physicality as they were, they lacked the fluidity and thought needed to truly bring peace, and eventually tribalism brought them to war among one another. Ancient bioweapons and terrible things designed to destroy the constitution of their liquid bodies scorched the planet and brought a single rebellious faction together with one goal in mind, to end the war. And that would involve unifying their consciousnesses, bringing together a mighty machine that would fuse their thoughts in one fell swoop. In doing so, it overwhelmed their minds and sunk them low slipping down into the lowest points of their worlds, their thoughts were gone. They were but now fluid. They were fluid before, of course, but inanimate now. This was now the primordial ooze, and as it sunk to the lowest points, it formed puddles, ponds, oceans of various sorts. Their minds withered in the billions of years that passed, and their world grew cold and dry. It left behind a blank slate for the Illuminator to begin his work once more. After this ordeal, seeing that, even in peace, civilization tended to stagnate and damn itself, the Illuminator could only ponder if he were the problem, if he were the one to doom his worlds. He didn't want to believe it, but in every world he had created, life would grow, and then it would pass with his presence and intervention. He wanted to change this. He wanted to make life that would continue to persist, at least for longer than it had done before. And thus he would use the deserts of terra firma one more time. He created life that would break this cycle. Or he gave them the gift, the essence of creation. Upon this blank slate, he named it Eartha, and the race he created were the Echidnas. He made a vow of silence from that point forward so that he may watch and see if his intervention was truly the cause of all this pain. Those that he brought into existence, the Echidna, were a very unique species. They were born with the upper halves of beautiful women and the lower halves of great titanic serpents. The word serpent here being used a little bit loosely for anything worm-like, if you will. Their lower halves could be equivocal to the dragons of Chinese mythology or to great centipedes. But all of them slithered and moved in such ways that would give them the opportunity to fill the sole goal the Illuminator had granted them. In their autonomy, they were given the goal to create and sustain life. Using the essence of creation and the power of birth, they brought forth the first creatures into Eartha, hulking behemoths that were neither plant nor animal nor fungi. They were nomads to live and to wander through the world with no mouths nor roof, roots, breathing for a time before slumping over deceased. They began creation with life, and then in due time it passed to death. And then from the remains that decayed, plants would bloom, and water would slosh from their veins, flowing down to the lowest points they could reach. Thousands of years would pass as Millions of these hulking titans would come and go. This was the first generation of the Echidna's young, and it set the scene for their ecosystems. It set soil, it grew plants, it bore fruit, and, well, sprouted ponds. All so the next generation made by the Echidna's would be able to be sustained. And then, when the job of these titans were done, those that remained returned to the Echidnas. They laid their heads in their mother's lap, 
of maps and, well, slept. Some were given the gift of knowledge and were reborn as something different, so that they could function in the ecosystems that they had created. And others were given the bliss of ignorance, so that they could pursue these same gifts without the knowledge of what they had created, only the knowledge that they would need to survive. But after them, life diversified into other things. This was the beginning of the second generation. These second generation children were the dragons. They came in various forms that bewilder and beguiled, but they could be put into several families. Three that are most distinct. The prehistoric dragons, the elder dragons, and the Levian. The prehistoric dragons were their very first attempts at creation after the Titans, and they were given the appearance of enormous reptiles. They sized larger than any mountain, and their wings beat with the might of storms. They had claws as sharp as swords, and their scales were as dense as shields. They were given the opportunity to rule over the various aspects of nature and various aspects of magic, with well, the firstborn of them being Iris, given domain over six for each of her heads, and the last of the Elder Dragons being Ragnarok, given domain over death, for he would be the last of them when their times came. The prehistoric dragons are most equivocal to dinosaurs in our world. Uh, large creatures that dominated the planet for a time, some layered with feather, others with a tough hide. All of them providing meat to the ecosystem and better enriching the soils for the third generation. The last of these were the Levians, as mentioned and they were long serpentine dragons that were designed as an effigy to the echidnas, floating through the air with many limbs on their slender, noodly bodies. And without wings, they floated around, cutting through the clouds and even breathing storm. They would stir the skies and establish weather, that which could feed the lands with out needing to sow water beneath every little root. With these three clades of dragons established now, the echidnas were able to bring their third generation into existence. This was known as the Great Cacophony, and this is where life truly diversified with fish and beast and bird coming from the echidnas, well, the life that was made became a little bit more quirky, if you will. They filled out unique niches that the echidnas picked out that never really needed to be. Some stayed by the echidnas and simply lived. Others were cast to the wilderness to find their place in the world, but all of them were strange little experiments. Some turned out well. Others were consumed by nature, added to the soil to feed the generations to come. But the experimentation during this time period happened to intrigue the elder to void above. When night falls on Eartha, the Illuminator turns away for a time, inhabiting the other side of the planet, the half that is faced to the dark of space, is a perfect uh, looking glass for the Eldritch Void. It allows them to see the life that the Illuminator has created, and some of them found it most intriguing. The creatures that interested them, they decided to inhabit linking their minds and souls to the hosts that the echidnas have fastened, these avatars would become godly in strength. 
Quetzaloth of the Echidnas was most well known for bringing these avatars into the world, and she was dubbed the Mother of Gods, for these were the gods of Earth. The Eldritch Void was now given a voice, a tool to act upon the Illuminator's worlds, a thing to inhabit. And though the dragons tended to conflict with these newfound gods and the quirky little creations that the Echidnas had brought into existence, the gods ruled above them. For the dragons, the Elder Dragons, were noble houses of magic and elements, but gods ruled over particular species and helped to keep them organized and under one motivation. Even the Elder Dragons were given a god of their own, which was their eldest sister, Iris. The last of their creations in the Great Cacophony would be a coordinator for the rest of their children. With tender love and care, they fastened together a host of artificial materials, clay and soil, at least that was the first, and adding the essence of creation into this vessel, they dubbed it the Echidnic King. It was the big brother to the rest of their creations, and they set it loose upon a throne so it could provide and protect from things and outsiders that would come. For the primordial ooze still exists at the very bottom of the world, and inside of terra firma's old, old palm, the abyss continued to meet. And thus, the gods as mortal as they were for the time being, and the Elder Dragons still needed some sort of protector, and that would be the Echidna King. Now, the first of them that had been made ended up abandoning his post due to a great melancholy that came with the position of ruler. He was isolated upon that throne, but the being in the Elder to Void talked to him, comforted him, and provided him an opportunity to ever enjoy the indulgences of life. That, being in the Elder to Void, turned him into a host, and he became a god dubbed Dionysus, who giddily intoxicated himself on wine and partying and the other spoils of life. The second Echidnic king that was born was dubbed Avalax, who was fastened out of marble. He was a mighty man who had the, well, sense of isolation extracted from him. He stood taller than many of the kin that the Echidna had created, and he was a stable ruler to watch over the cycle of life. And he would sit upon that throne for quite some time as the Echidnas brought themselves in, well, the fourth generation. This was but an extension of the Great Cacophony, a second part, if you will, that continued to make now with the Echidnic King watching over their various sons and daughters, and one form of life that they had created was designed to give a bit of lesser coordination, I suppose. If the Echidnic King was the king, the gods were lords, and the dragons knights. This particular race was designed to be just beneath them. They were humanity, and humanity was made with a very specific goal in mind, as many other things in the Great Cacophony did. They had the niche, object, uh, niche ability to categorize things. They were tribal, and they were, well, perhaps the first political things to ever come from the Great Cacophony. They liked putting things in groups automatically. It was a habit of theirs, and that was their purpose, to categorize and uh, organize. And they were inhibited by this with the lack of magic. They were... Particularly bland, I suppose, except for their great and vast intellects. 
and though they inquired to the echidnas why they would be left out of such opportunities to manipulate magic by pure instinct, they did not rectify this perceived mistake. They understood that with the presentation of magic to them, it could cause quite a few problems. Rather than categorizing on their own, they would make categories using this magic, press things into squares and shapes that were, well, not needed, not intended. And this lack of magic dissatisfied humanity. It made them a tad jealous of their siblings. And so, for the first time in thousands of years, the Illuminator heard a voice as humanity called out, his grandchildren praying and begging for a gift, the gift of magic. And though the Illuminator had not intervened in quite some time, the sound of someone deliberately asking for his assistance, that swayed him. And to them he gifted a god of man, the learned man. This human, with magical powers built into his instincts, he gifted them with arcane abilities, teachings. He taught to them how to manipulate the world in good faith. But sects of humanity, tribes that were contempt towards the echidnas, they would begin bolstering their knowledge of magic in the form of crafty weapons, enchantments, spells, and other things. The echidnas were unsuspecting of what was to come, but the echidnic king Avalax, even from this great distance, saw what humanity was fascinating. The echidnas were unsuspecting of their children, for they were not made with uh, paranoia or malice in mind. So, with Avalax being granted such gifts, he began to plot and to plan to try and prevent humanity from taking advantage of the Illuminator's mercy. The first thing he did was he commissioned his sister Quetzaloff begin creating specific and complex pieces of art, ones that were, in truth, weapons of his own, disguised as pieces that were to satisfy his creativity. And the other thing that he did was directly approach his sisters, convening with the greatest of them to warn of humanity's rise and how they intended to take revenge on the Echidnas. He requested that humanity be dismantled, to be the first and only of their children cast to extinction for the preservation of the rest. His sisters, who could not believe the words he spouted, nor the fact that he had capability for such zealotry, decided that this could not do. Looking to preserve their young, including humanity, they dismantled Avalax, pulling him to pieces and casting those parts into great tombs where he and the artifacts made in artistic intent were laid to sleep. In the wake of Avalax's dismantling, the Echidnic King had to be born anew, and humanity would continue to grow in the background as a new individual took the throne. This Echidnic King was fashioned by wood and plant, and he was made expressly with mercy in mind to avoid the woes of Avalax that had been brought. This Echidnic King was Flor de Lore, and he sat upon the throne, watching as creation continued onwards, just as unsuspecting as his sisters, while humanity brewed building up a magical arsenal and studying the essences that construct reality, the weapons they forged would eventually draw blood. The first of humanity to strike was dubbed Judas, and his action was simple. He walked up to an echidna and stabbed her dead with a blade that could pierce the scales on her breast. 
Horror swept over the lands as the rest of humanity followed, using great magical tools to hunt down echidnas by the hundreds, and began a purge against both elder dragons and gods. This was known as the First Crusade, and the echidnas were quickly pushed to death's dark door as they rushed towards extinction. The elder dragons abandoned their posts and crawled underground to sleep until humanity had passed, forming the mountains and valleys with their sheer size. With so many dying souls rising into the skies above, the Illuminator was quaked with fear and sorrow, for his intervention had condemned his creation once again. The learned man left his people, leaving only the gifts that he had granted them behind. And soon the Illuminator began to drench the world in his tears. Massive storms followed the slaughter of the Echidna, an immense flood consuming the world and pushing the last remnants of life to collect on a single massive continent. Only when the souls of the Echidnas collected to comfort their father did his tears dry and the rain stop leaving the last gasps of humanity struggling on what dry land was left. The remains of the Echidnas were protected under the third Echidna king, who sacrificed his body to bring forth a jungle incomprehensibly large. His essence of creation was sown through the ground, and a blotch of endless living forest was scattered between the mountains of the Elder Dragons, and a single surviving desert which was, well, squeezed humanity all between it. They survived only on an outcroft, a piece of land uninhabited by the jungle and not too disrupted by the draconic mountains. The echidnas that were given cover within the living jungle survived for a time and others that were not given that opportunity retreated northwards to the cold, beyond the draconic mountains, hoping to survive with the new creations they could make. Humanity, uh, left in this little sect, formed an empire once again. With so few of them left behind after this great collapse, they hoped to build themselves. Isolating in their small pocket of land, their population boomed under a single emperor. And after they had finished growing, they decided to dub this continent the Ire. For they saw the rains brought by the Illuminator's tears as his wrathful punishment for the actions they had committed to the Echidnas. Rather than taking this as a sign to cease their hateful deeds, they decided that they would continue to consume and destroy. Their population was growing too big, and they held slights for the Echidnas for the time being. A faction of them would remain here in the Empire content with their land, while two others would split off, one heading to the far west and one heading to the far north, cutting their way through jungle and crossing the valleys. This began a new age, at least for humanity, who would set up kingdoms and provinces far, far away, and thus establishes the creation of Eartha, the beginning of man, and perhaps a time closer to the current date. And in a stream later, I would like to cover more of the details involved with this as we close in to the current, but I suppose I have finished my great ramblings, the story of how it all began. And the people in call with me are free to ask questions, things that I could elaborate on, and perhaps flesh out this story a bit more, how it was all created. Would anyone like to speak and toss those questions my way? It would elaborate things to the audience if there's anything that I have missed. Mm -hmm. 
it's uh, how much of this history is actually known in the current day. Well, in the current day, little of it is known. There is a great event that would come after the establishment of humanity's first empire and its expansion that would cause much of it to be extinguished, burnt into cinder. <laughs> but many ruins and artifacts do exist from the Echidnas in the current date, and many of the actions of humanity would continue to linger. Things such as the gods would inevitably return from their slumber, those that survived the First Crusade, and the Elder Dragons, their mountains and volcanoes that they formed where they slept, would be established by various creatures, kinds. Hmm. So even after the immense, I would dare say, magically driven creation of things, with life being established, there was still the natural flow of life. Things went extinct and new species evolved, I guess. Indeed. Though, compared to our own world, things would happen at a hastened pace. The presence of magic is quite formative. Being able to develop arcane abilities, uh, or being granted them on conception by the Echidnas, that impacted the world quite a bit. The rush of a million years of evolution is something that could happen over a rather short amount of time, at least for this magical world in question. And from the viewpoint of those on Earth, uh, there is a space, there is a cosmos, but how might that differ from what we know about ours in the real world. Ah, greatly. The black canvas of space is the Eldritch Void, the souls of the gods who use vessels as avatars upon the world. But importantly, the stars and the celestial bodies in the cosmos are not rocks, chemicals, and other reactions bursting and exploding. Rather, the, they are custodians, made by the Illuminator. In the wake of the Echidnas rising from the world below, the Illuminator would collect their souls. In the forms of glinting radiant sparks, he would make a habit of doing this to improve the company around him. The souls of all those who had passed from that point forwards would radiate and form constellations, shimmering in the skies above, and to give them company, and perhaps even serve them to some degree, he fastened together angeloids, beings that were purely for the purposes of making sure that this cosmos was in good condition, and to ensure that the asylum formed by his radiant glow was best tended to even with the world he had fastened producing a space for the Eldritch Void to inch closer. These angeloids come in many different forms. Those you could equate to shooting stars are seraphim, multi-headed feathered beasts that are covered in color. They fly through the sky during the evenings and draw auroras with the beat of their wings. Another being the Cherium, massive planets that are in truth eyes, some possessing halos formed as rings around them. They look upon the world from a distance, though some inch particularly close during the evening hours to drink in the spectacle that is the world. They function as extinctions of the Illuminator, allowing him to see in the nighttime where the world would block his view. Is there any titles to the names of the eras that we've passed through up to this point? Indeed. 
At the beginning was the Era of Darkness. Then, with the presence of the Illuminator, it was the Era of Enlightenment. The Abyssal Area is ti- uh, the Abyssal Era, my apologies, is titled to when the world had been shattered. And then the Era of Terra Firma was titled to that for what came afterwards. The great hand that closed the rift, sealed the abyss. And then, beyond that, was the Era of Creation, where the echidnas had been laid across the lands and brought into existence various creatures, including the dragons and the original titans that had created the cycle of life. Uh, past that, there was the Era of Strife, where humanity had first been made, and Avalax had grown suspicious of their intentions. With the death of the Echidnas and the flooding of the world came the Era of Second Death, and for the purposes of our storytelling, that is where it continues, up until the Era of Tension, the present day. We will be covering the details of the Second Death's later half and the beginning of the Era of Tension at a, another point. So we've, we've given insight into how the cosmos is different. The planet itself, Earth that we know, essentially metal and rock, chunk of mineral with a thin layer of liquid and life on the surface comparatively, in a thin layer of atmosphere, how would Eartha differ? In its current state, Eartha differs both in size and construction. Being this great geode that was made by the Illuminator to hold the abyss inside of itself, the outer layer is an atmosphere about three times as tall as what Earth could provide. And the construction of Eartha is about three times as large. But with the uh, beginning of Second Death being that great flooding caused by the Illuminator's tears, it was left with only a single landmass, a continent, about equivalent in size to all the landmasses of Earth, and surrounding it a great, great sea. One wide and lonely, called the Sea of Tears. It would deviate later on as gods made domains in the waters, and the landmass itself would be sectioned into a north, south, east, and western region, with the north being cold and the south being hot, the west and east being in between. But as you go below these, the soil begins to mix and harden into stone, with the bones of the Elder Dragons, now in their great deadly sleep, making up the mountains, instead of having pockets of magma forming volcanoes and tectonic plates pushing against one another to fasten uh, mountain ranges. And beneath them, and that stone, is the layer of gemstone that mixes with a magma ocean, both intertwined until you finally arrive at the rift that is the abyss. Down in the abyss, it is an ever-cramped world in which souls of the prior residents have accumulated, those immortal continuing to subsist on hellish energies, and those condemned to this domain, making up the cities, the brick, and the ground. That is how Eartha is constructed, far more magically inclined than what Earth had. Okay, and I think I heard another question starting, so I will sit back and make sure that floor is open for them. Going back to uh, what he was saying before, actually following up with it. Were Echidnas born along uh, with their creation of humanity with the concept of 
mortality from the Illuminator? Or how does how do they view mortality in the sense of the two of us and the heavens in this? The echidnas they... no. My apologies. The echidnas were made with mortality in mind since they were given the idea to create and subsist. With life, they deemed death as a necessity, for if they continued to create and create, they would never be able to satisfy the hunger of their children. There would be no plants or trees. They would need death to feed these things and to sow them into the land. And with death, the bodies would decay, creating soil in place of dust giving things for plants to feed upon, and, from the original titans, bringing water, lakes, and ponds into the world. They were given the concept of death, and, even if they were not, they were given the ability to die. And, figuring that out of themselves, they gave their creations that ability, so they could form this cycle. So they would be able to continue to feed. By having a cycle, they created something that could subsist itself, instead of being alive and then dying, as the Illuminator had done before. And then, in the wake of them being dead, their souls simply returned to their creator. And that is when the cosmos formed. Originally it was but darkness, giving the Eldritch Void free reign to make the gods that it wished, the avatars made by the Echidnas being most appropriate for them to take. Are there any other questions that follow this that could help to continue to elaborate on the world? One such question, as this will be my last question, because I hear the start of another one, is that besides the heavens, the Eldritch Void, and such other things, are there other things that have created as uh, ra rather offshoots or as different things, such as uh, different realms and different places besides the abyss and heavens that have come in tandem as a byproduct of the creation? To give titles to the many layers of this reality, at the bottom of it is the Abyss itself, and then above that is Eartha. Beyond them, the Stars, a new name given to the Asylum that is more appropriate now that there are glinting bits of light beyond the world. Beyond the Asylum is the Eldritch Void, and beyond that is the Realm of Dreams and then the static. But there do indeed exist pockets, most of which smaller bubbles that float around this one out in the static. Uh, to elaborate on some of these, there is the timeless realm, a place in the realm of dreams in which time does not tick. Thoughts do not manifest here, but those who happen to find their ways to it find themselves unable to change. Their bodies and that which goes on within them do not continue to tick. They do not need to eat, nor do they wither by time. All they need is to think, for their thoughts are not stagnant. They change, them being in the realm of dreams. The rest of the dream realm is... Not like this. Time continues to tick there, and if you were to go, you may find your body changing in very different ways, as your thoughts impact how you are. Another realm is quite a, communic uh, quite a comedic one that has spurred off of the actions of humanity. Humanity brought quite a bit of death, and many of the 
bits of knowledge that were learned by the learned man were adapted for war, and a group of arcanists and wizards had decided to create a being of ultimate magic, one made from the many bones of the creatures they had put to extinction. But in this great magical body that they made, the mind they had fastened into it was rather aloof. It was incompetent, and they had nicknamed this construct the Great Doink, for he was a failure to them, in spite of the mighty bits of magic that he carried. So he was abandoned and cast out. He was left to brew with his own thoughts, a child without parent, and he grew very contempt of his creators, and decided that this reality did not vibe with him, and thus created a bit of land, a plot, out in the static. He named this location the Bone Zone, where he would take the withered bones of Eartha and the slain beasts before it, and would construct residence there making the land this scabby, dry, stagnant location, an afterlife where he subsisted as its one god and ruler. He would steal souls that were meant to go to their rightful place in the stars or the abyss below, and would give them new bodies there, treating them as citizens and acting as their king. It was a very bleak and a very drab location with a rather stupid tyrant as their ruler. But it was an alternative to the hellish and cramped uh, abyss below and the rather monotonous eternity in the stars. Many other deities decided to make their own afterlives as well. Lady Death, an embodiment much like Ragnarok, decided to collect souls and keep them in what was effectively a stopwatch. It was her method of extending her life. The souls would sleep eternally, and she would gather as many years as they had lived, thus encouraging her to make lives as long as possible. Another world being a sort of uh, tranquil domain, a safe house for one of the gods, was for Budilla the Jolly. Budilla the Jolly was this large anthropomorphic panda. And when I say anthropomorphic, I mean he only had human actions. His body was very much a panda, a big, hulking, soft thing. He was jolly, and was a god of both his kind and tranquility, and using his godly capabilities, created an outcroft in the realm of dreams, in which he and the rest of his followers could hide in their afterlives, giving them a place to ever mull on the aspects of reality, until they got so tranquil that they were effectively asleep for eternity. Then there is Eden, the Garden of Eden, created by a god of dryads known as the Banana Man. Uh, <laughs> he created this place to be a penultimate uh, garden, where he could experiment with his godly capabilities and grow all sorts of strange and alien plants but a rather uh, inquisitive human wanted to get into the Garden of Eden to collect these magical plants, and in doing so, the Banana Man was forced to preserve it by destroying its entrance, leaving this realm locked away forever. It was another outcroft in the realm of dreams, and perhaps you could wander in there, but for now, it is closed. Those are the known realms, and there are likely many unknown realms that exist within the static and the realm of dreams, and perhaps on the back of great eldritch beings in the void. But I do hope that answers your question. 
Are there any others? Hmm. I'm unsure. Well, I suppose it is a question. Though, whether this is the... place for a certain topic that perhaps later will be more explained in further depth, as there are many facets to this bit of uh, topic, many uh, tangents to go off of, bringing up both uh, terra, terra Firma before and Lady Death does bring a a possible bit of explanation about this world, a bit of detail about it that distinguishes it from the normal world in a much more major, yet still minor way to the others, and that's what it's exactly made of. Ah, so your question is effectively, what makes the world? Not just the history of it, but what constructs it down to the atom? Or, in this case, the essence. This world, and thus much of its reality, is made with magic. This magic has been dubbed essence, and that can be used for the essence of death, the essence of life, the essence of creation. And it comes in a bit of a paradoxical form. It exists in spite of the matter around it, and it exists because of it, it causes that matter to exist, and is somewhat separate sometimes. But usually, essences are the magical little uh, webbings that connect everything together. If you wanted to equate it to anything, it is the laws of nature or the uh, laws of gravity it could be used to describe gravity it is the unseen thing that makes things what do they are and essences can be espoused to things such as fire and water which we are very familiar with but they can additionally be given to concepts that are far more ethereal or hypothetical such as the essence of scent, or the essence of royalty. These are things that bring into existence because of compounds. There is only the essence of creation at the beginning of it all, and the essence of divinity, which the Illuminator carries himself. But branching off of these things is fire, water, earth, air, order and chaos. These each pair together two at a time and create other things. Uh, fire and water making steam. Earth and water creating life. L uh, order and fire making light. Fire and <laughs> chaos making ice. And this continues to an almost infinite extent, as these compounds can thus be compounded with one another, or combined with its ancestors, its parent essences, creating new ones. These essences go on and on, and usually can be quantified as a single particle, a single point in reality. And as many of those points exist, they latch to one another and create things that are far more material, that we can properly define, such as a puddle of water or a patch of dirt, uh, collections of metals and other things like that. The world of Eartha is made of magic, and sometimes that can be very hard to define. In fact, maddeningly so, as the farther you go down, the more you realize that there is no bottom. And thus, science in Eartha is a bit more about where the end is rather than how you get there. Now. I suppose as a small 
a follow up and perhaps a further, more of a sneak peek at what further topics may come on the more specific and future entities to arrive in this world, and that is of the matter of terra firma, and the fact that it's not more than a simple stone hand encasing something as it is bound by essence and is alive. Correct. correct. You are correct. Most things uh, are in that little gray area between alive and not alive. You have the primordial ooze and the liquids that it dilutes into, and that creates life through slime. But you also have the animals that have been made by the echidnas, and you additionally have that such as essences embodied fairies, and magic that takes its own living form. Things such as terra firma, though, are uniquely embodied. They are raw magic, raw this, raw stuff that makes up existence, since they are created by the Illuminator himself. And Terra Firma, along with Lady Death and a few other unique entities that the Echidna King was made to protect the rest of the Echidna's creations from, those can be identified as incarnates, or S incarnates, for they embody the essences specifically. They may not be as strong as the gods, but they do serve a similar purpose. They rule an aspect of existence and help to sustain it, unlike the Elder Dragons, who are simply there to organize it. So, Terra Firma is alive. It at least used to be, and so are many other things that we would not consider alive. I suppose that raises the question of what an organism is, if not all of them are organic. I think the term nism is most appropriate, though I can imagine that isms and nisms can sometimes be uh, uh, misidentified there. But I suppose that leaves us open to another question, if anyone happens to have it. Shoot, what's your question? One such question is that while we know that the whole uh, entity and if not world of Eartha and Terra Farma is magical in nature, being uh, in complete sense and paradoxical, how would you describe the technology age? The technological or age. The technological age of Eartha is a tad variable. There is that ancient mythological technology that the Echidnas bore for the purposes of creating art rather than creating creatures. There are the tribal technologies of humanity that climbed and climbed into a sort of Neolithic and then Bronze Age, where the Empire of Humanity currently sits in our little recap of history. But beyond that, it continues to diversify as new races come to existence as a consequence of humanity, so do new pockets of technology, some centralized on magic, others more focused on the engineering aspect of things. It really depends on where you come from and what section of Eartha you speak, but to make things rather clear, in the current date, you could find some great machine, some steampunk apparatus in the same uh, general area as a ritual circle, shamanistic and old. Are there any other questions? 
ones that could help us continue to elaborate on the fundamentals of this world. If not, then we can end the questions there and the recap of Eartha's history, the beginning of the tale, how it all came to be, at least in its first part. I suppose with there being plenty of time, we could continue to expand on this prehistory. And now that I think about it, that is appropriate. I think there's more to tell than simply how things came to be, or at least more of how it came to be. The start is only the beginning for a reason, and this is a beginning far off from the end. Far off from the current, too. I feel that the next time around we discuss these things, we shall dive into the conception of many other races. Elves, dwarves, centaurs, and dragonkin, all constructed as a consequence of humanity's continued pursuits and expanding and swelling its empire across the continent of the Ire. But... We shall save that for another time. This is only the beginning, and I hope next time around, next weekend perhaps, we'll have an opportunity to further discuss it all. For the time being, I feel this is a good place to pause, a good place to say goodbye and good night. And hopefully, next time around, there will be some new faces, and some questions to answer for those curious about this world. We shall continue to build it, and we shall continue to build it together.